You know, a kid asked me one time, what's your net worth? I blurted it out. I never thought about it. I thought, well, my net worth is what good I do with what I have. And I believe that. You are listening to Ken Langone. Ken is a billionaire investor and entrepreneur. If you walk around New York City, you'll see Ken's name on impressive buildings. But Ken will be the first person to tell you that he's just like anyone else. Look at me! Christ sakes, a dumb kid from Long Island that barely got out of high school that almost flunked out of college? Come on! I'm not a rocket scientist. I'm not a nuclear physicist. I'm not a, a bioengineer. I'm none of those things. I'm a kid of limited ability, and, and here I live in a great society that whatever talent I had, I was able to exploit it, and look at what happened. What happened is this. Ken went from someone who made $82 a week to becoming one of the richest people in the world. And every time his personal wealth increased, so did what he gave back. In fact, Ken says that for all of his giving, hundreds of millions of dollars in total, there's something even greater that anyone can do. And in this episode, he'll share what it is. You'll also learn how Ken discovered his path and overcame several setbacks to achieve everything he ever dreamed, and then some. And you'll hear why he feels responsible to help others do the same. This is Crazy Good Turns, we tell inspiring stories about people who do amazing things for others. I'm your host, Brian Sabin. Today, Ken is 82 years old. He's a billionaire several times over, having helped launch public companies like Ross Perot's Electronic Data Systems and The Home Depot. But Ken grew up poor. His dad was a plumber. His mom worked in a school cafeteria. But Ken says that what they may have lacked in material things, they made up for in love and caring for one another. It was a simple existence, but it was a wonderful existence. I was born into a family who believed in affection and love and unconditional love. And, and this extended to my extended family, my aunts, my uncles. My father was one of many, many children. My mother was one of six children. The families lived nearby each other, and so we saw a lot of each other in each other's houses. And that, to me, is critical to a youngster's development, to have that feeling of security, to know that no matter what, somebody's there for you, waiting for you, and loves you. Early on in his life, Ken wasn't much of a student. In fact, he says he only gained entry to college through a chance encounter. He'd went to Bucknell University to visit some friends, and there he had the good fortune to impress the right person. I had no plans of going to college. I just got up there almost by accident for a weekend with friends of mine who were there. And they told me to go see the admissions guy, and I went, and four days later, he sends me a, an application and, and what's got to be done, and he says, if you want to come to Bucknell, we'd be happy to have you. In the margin of the letter he wrote, which was a typewritten letter, he wrote, in college, you'll have to work much harder than you did in high school. Well, hell, that was easy, because I never worked, and I didn't do a damn thing in high school. Ken had gotten lucky. He'd been given a chance. But not everyone thought he'd make good on the opportunity. In fact, one of his biggest doubters was his high school principal, who said as much to Ken's own mother. My high school principal told my mom the night that I graduated from high school, because he knew her because she worked in the school cafeteria, he said, Angie, I hate to tell you this, but Ken's not college material, and uh, he'll be home by Christmas. The next morning, uh, we had a custom. We used to go out to Montauk Point graduation night, all the kids. And when I came back the next morning, my mother was in this living room of this little, small, wood frame house, and she was in tears, and I thought, who died? And she said, well, nobody died. And I said, what are you crying for? She said, well, Mr. Ross told me that you're not going to graduate from college, that you're going to be thrown out. I said, what do you mean? He says, you're not going to make it. You'll be out by Christmas. And I said, that's not going to happen. Well, as God would have it, I almost did get thrown out within the first three months I was there. Actually, he almost got thrown out twice. The first time was for academics. Ken was a less-than-stellar student during his first few months, but he was able to stay in school because of an economics professor who thought he showed promise. The second time had more to do with behavior. While I was still at the end of my first semester, a bunch of kids went out to a diner on a late Friday night, and we raised some hell, and the diner owner called the cops, and a bunch of us got locked up. The next day, the dean of men 
came to two of us, myself and another fellow, and said, look, I don't want this thing to get out of hand, and it was a bunch of you kids. Uh, how about if you kids go tell the cops that you were the ones that were raising the hell? It's okay. So a friend of mine and I went down to the Justice of the Peace and pled guilty to a disorderly conduct charge and told him it was just us. The other kids didn't do anything. And he said, okay. And as I said, we paid thirty-seven fifty, and we pled guilty to a misdemeanor. I went back up to campus and we went into the dean's office. We were kind of hoping we were going to be treated like heroes because we took a hit for the team. And we got in his office, and he says, okay, I want you to go to your rooms and pack your stuff up and get out of here. And we said, what do you mean? He said, yeah, you're out of here. But Ken got lucky a second time. He knew an admissions director named Fitzwalling, and he was able to talk the dean out of his decision. The dean agreed to keep Ken and his friend in school, but there was a catch. He's all right. He said, you kids are not going home. You can go home for Easter vacation or Easter the weekend, but you are going to stay here for all your vacations and rake leaves. I thought to myself, how the hell do I deal with this? So what I did was I called my mother and I said, Mom, you have no idea how I've gotten into my studies up here. I'm so excited about my studies. What I'm going to do, Mother, is I'm going to come home for Easter Sunday, but I'm going to stay up here, and when we have breaks, I'm going to spend it getting ahead of my class by study. And she said to me, she was so happy. She said, oh, I've been praying to St. Anthony every night that you get serious, and he's answering my prayers. And I said, well, yeah, Mom. Ken calls this a turning point in his life. He really did focus solely on his studies during the months that followed. He became a model student and went on to graduate early in just three and a half years. He had a reason to hurry. He'd met the love of his life, Elaine. They married just before his senior year, and soon after Ken graduated, the two moved together to New York City. My wife was working in New York as a receptionist. We had a little apartment out in Flushing, which is in Queens. We thought the world was about perfect shape for us. We were having the time of our lives. We didn't have children initially, so it was just the two of us and a little dog we had, and it was idyllic, and it was, it was fun, and, and we still reflect on those days. We didn't have a hell of a lot, but we had each other. At the time, Ken was working at an insurance company by day and going to school at night to earn an MBA. He wasn't making a lot of money, but he had an encounter that sparked an urge to give back whatever he could. It was 1957, winter of 57, and I was going to NYU at night my first semester there. The graduate school was on Trinity Place downtown, and there was a horn and hearted automat on the corner. That's where you go in and you put nickels in a slot, and in back of the nickel, it's like these old post office mailboxes. It's got a window. You can get a cup of coffee. There's a coffee in back of that one, or there's a piece of pie, or there's a donut, or there's a roll. And I used to go in at 5.30 and get myself a cup of coffee and a roll because I couldn't afford to go out for dinner. I was making all of 80-some bucks a week at the insurance company. And I went to classes after I went to the Horn and Hard Art. And when I came out about 9 o'clock, there was a man standing there with his hand out. And I gave him a dollar. I'll never forget it. I gave him a dollar. That was a lot of money to me. I was making 82 bucks a week. You know what a dollar is. And I had this enormous feeling of good. I had this great sense of, gee, you know what? I'm pretty good. Not an arrogance, but a, just a sense of, I can make a difference. And, and that feeling has stayed with me to this day, this very day. Ken's career accelerated pretty quickly from there. Within a few years, he left the job in insurance for Wall Street. He took a pay cut to get there, but he negotiated to get a portion of every deal he could close. And soon, he was closing plenty of them. By 1966, he was made a partner in the company. That's just 13 years after his high school principal had said Ken wouldn't make it through college. My firm had put together a tombstone to be printed in the Wall Street Journal that listed the names of, I was not the only partner that year. There was a number of us made partners. And this principal, by now, had retired to Maine. And I gather he read the Wall Street Journal because a few days after it was printed, I got a note from him, and all it had in the envelope was the tombstone cut out, 
and across it he'd written how wrong I was, which I thought was a class act on his part. Two years after being made a partner, another chance encounter would change Ken's life. I had the good fortune to meet up with a man by the name of Ross Perot in the spring of night, well, the late winter of 1968. He was getting ready to go public, take his company, Electronic Data Systems, public. I persuaded him to let me be the managing underwriter, and he did, and it worked out to be a phenomenal deal. I guess what you could say is I made my bones. I became known because of this deal that everybody wanted. The deal made Perot a billionaire, and Langone did pretty well on it himself. He was in a position to pay it forward. His first major donation went back to his alma mater, Bucknell. Ken gifted the school a sizable sum, one that impressed everyone except his father. Well, we were sitting there after lunch. Elaine says, why don't you tell Pop-Up? That's what the kids called They had Pop-Up. Why don't you tell Pop-Up what we did for Bucknell? And I says, sure. So my dad, listen, he was eating his lunch, and he said to me, uh, what'd you do? I said, well, Dad, I said, Elaine and I gave Bucknell a gift in honor of Fitz Walling, and he put his fork down. And he looked at me, and he said, well, what'd you give up? I said, what do you mean, what did I give up? He said, well, what are you going to go without? You mean, what am I going to go without because I gave the money? I said, absolutely nothing. He said, well, that's not real charity. I said, what do you mean? He said, real charity is when you give up something for somebody else, and you make a sacrifice. Ken says that he realized his father was right, and that conversation changed the way he looked at charity and giving from that moment onward. He's right. And I think one of the reasons that I hope I'm more remembered for the time I gave to charities than the money, because we all have the same amount of time. We all have the same days with the same hours and the same minutes. And so whenever I spend time on my charities, I'm really sacrificing Langone says there's a flip side to that perspective shift. Anyone who gives their time to something is far more generous than they realize. Charity, unfortunately, most people take to mean given money. Charity's more than given money. Charity's given of yourself. Langone and his wife continued to give both time and money. Elaine is a trustee for the Boys Club of New York and the city's Animal Medical Center. Ken donates his time to the Harlem Children's Zone Promise Academy and the Ronald McDonald House. Together, the two have pledged hundreds of millions of dollars to various causes. More than $200 million of that went to NYU's medical school alone. I really got excited because I said, holy smokes, they got some of the greatest doctors practicing some of the greatest medicine in the most horrible, horrible facilities. I can fix this. And I went home to my wife and I said to Elaine, I said, Elaine, I've got this opportunity and I really think I want to do it. How do you feel about us giving $100 million to the medical center as the beginning of my relationship as chairman? They want me to become chairman. And she said to me, do we have that kind of money? I said, yeah, I think we can handle it. The full list of things Ken has done would be too long to list on air, and it continues to this day. He recently stepped in to help a guest from Crazy Good Turn Season 1, the Stephen Siller Tunnel to Towers Foundation. Here's how Foundation Chairman Frank Siller describes Ken in their first meeting. Energetic very compassionate and very passionate on anything that he gets involved with. He's a very emotional person that gets it, and once he gets it, you know what happens. (laughs) This guy makes sure things happen in a good, positive, and lasting way where he could change people's lives. That's what he's been doing all his life. His success is uh, he's been able to share that success on many different levels with so many different families, through health care, and most certainly with our veterans. Listeners may remember that Tunnel to Towers built smart homes for America's heroes, like veterans who've lost limbs in combat. So many of these guys have come home from Iraq and Afghanistan. They survived injuries that they would never have survived on the battlefield 20, 30, 40 years ago. They would have been gone. But they're coming back with these horrific injuries, so many of them missing three, four limbs. And so there's a tremendous need for these type of houses with these special amenities in it that give them back some of their independence. In May of this year, Ken put together a fundraiser that brought Tunnel to Towers more than $4 million in one night. Siller says it was the most money the organization has ever seen at once, 
and it will go towards building homes for dozens of soldiers and their family members. It is building these houses for the people who have given us the lives, our great warriors who go out there and give us the, the lifestyle that we have in this country. So it's only fitting to make sure that we you know, take care of those who have given us what we have today. Ken says he does it all for several reasons. Part of it is a sense of gratitude to the people who helped him get where he is. I'm a product, frankly, of the professor that said he was going to help me out of my nosedive, of the dean of admissions who was going to make sure they didn't throw me out, of my mother and father, of, I mean, I can go on and on and on. There were literally hundreds of people, thousands of people, all the kids that work at Home Depot. Where did the success come from? It came from their hard work in the stores. When you talk to Ken, you'll hear him bring up the kids often. The kids are the 400,000-plus Home Depot employees. Ken co-founded the Home Depot with Bernie Marcus and Arthur Blank in 1978. And to this day, he has a deep affection for the men and women who work in Home Depot stores. The kids that work in the stores, and they're wonderful. They're, you know, most of them didn't go to college. Most of them just wanted to have a, some kind of career path opportunity. And we were blessed to have them all show up. And I watched how they worked these crazy hours, and I watched how hard they worked when I went into the stores. And I enjoyed being with them, and I still do. And, you know, they're, they're fun, and to hear their success stories, and we have a marvelous statistic. We have, obviously, Bernie and Arthur and I did very well by the success of Home Depot. We have 3,000 kids who came to work for us in the lot, that is, pushing carts in and helping Customers load their stores up, 3,000. They're multimillionaires today. That number, 3,000 millionaires, is something that Ken comes back to regularly. He says it's proof that capitalism works. He's so passionate about the system that he just released a book titled, I Love Capitalism. He says he wanted to show everyone why the system is a force for good. It works. It were the 400,000 kids at Home Depot, the 3,000 millionaire, multimillionaires at Home Depot, the kids that had better lives tonight because they got a good job. You want to see how good it works? Go to Russia. Go to these socialistic countries. And you say to yourself, what's the difference? The difference is you can motivate people. And we're not equal. I'm, I'm, if you put me on a baseball field against Alec Rodriguez, hell, I'd strike out every time and he'd hit a home run every time. So I'm not a baseball player. I'm a businessman. And I'm good at what I do. But the challenge is to make sure you bring as many people to the party who want to come to the party. The party, or the dance, is something else that Ken mentions regularly. It's his way of describing a better life. It's something he says he's trying to help people achieve in as many ways as he can. Ronald McDonald House. You take that one, for example. I remember when I got involved some 20-some years ago, 27. We were on the biggest Ronald McDonald House in the world here in Manhattan. We have 102 rooms, I think. Ten floors. And when I started, 80% of the kids would go home and die. And today, 80% of the kids go home and live. For example, childhood leukemia, which was a death sentence 50 years ago, we pretty much got that beat. Bucknell University, I've got a scholarship program. I went up two weeks ago and had dinner with all my scholars. There's 38 of them. To see these kids and to realize that you've got a small part in giving them a shot at a better life, that's pretty heavy stuff. It's a great joy in my life. And I spend most of my time on charity now. And that's what it should be like. You know, I've, I've done well, and I think it's time to start thinking about it, including your ability, you know, and your time. And, and frankly, the time comports more with what my dad's measure of charity is because when I give time up, I'm not getting it back. And I'm sacrificing. When you hear a story like Ken's, it is easy to feel overwhelmed. Most of us don't have millions to give. Some of us are struggling simply to make ends meet which is why Ken's perspective on giving is so refreshing. Ken's outlook shows that you can give richly, even if you don't have riches to give. In fact, the most valuable thing you can offer is yourself. I tell people the most powerful things I know in life are a kind word, a thoughtful gesture, and passion and enthusiasm for everything you're doing. Thank you for listening to this episode of our podcast. Go to crazygoodturns.org to learn more about Ken 
or to submit ideas for other people we should feature on an upcoming episode. You can stay connected with us by following us on Twitter or Facebook at forward slash crazy good turns. Our show is audio engineered by Stephen Key, music supervision and mixing by Score Score in Los Angeles. A special thanks to Megan Basinger, and I'm your host, Brian Sabin. Seeing somebody who's down and saying hi to them in a more friendly way or telling somebody they did a great job and how grateful you are, all those things, that's a form of charity, and I think we need more of it in this world.